Machines use APIs, or application programming interfaces, to communicate. And this is how startups expose their functionality to developers at enterprises or other startups. My name is Rob DeFeo. I'm a startup advocate at AWS and podcast host of Startup Engineering. I spend my time helping founders, CTOs, and engineers build their technology and products. In this video, I'll explain why building an API is important and the different approaches, tools, and then give some guidance on how to pick the right tool for the right situation. First, I'll take you through why an API is important, and then we'll get into the details of how to build one. While humans interact with products through websites and mobile phones, machines take a, a more direct approach, and they use APIs to communicate with each other. Traditionally, the term API was used to define how machines communicate. But more recently, with more people generally using the term to describe communication that happens between machines over the internet. Startups use both API Gateway and AppSync to create APIs. These tools, though, do create distinct types of APIs, and they're known as REST or GraphQL. I'll briefly explain each one and what tools you can use and when and how people should use them. REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer, is an established way of communicating over the internet. It represents each resource as URLs, and it uses commands like get, post, put, and delete. And these would create, read, update, or delete each individual resource. This combination of actions is known as CRUD. In the case of an online store, a get request to slash products will return a list of products or a get request to slash products slash ID would return a specific single product. Web browsers use REST requests to browse the internet, a get command to get pages, and a post command to send information. API Gateway is an end-to-end -end solution for developers when building REST APIs at any scale. It supports the open API standard and makes it easy to use with developer tooling and inside code. I think of GraphQL as a query language, where you have control over what data that it returns. Like REST, it communicates over HTTP, but it does things a little differently. It uses one endpoint, and the requests are either a query, a mutation, or a subscription. Queries are like GET requests in REST, but with more features, and they're actually quite similar to a database query. Used correctly, they can be a really efficient and a flexible way to get data because you don't need to go and alter the backend code to change the response. Instead, client developers can limit the number of rows with filters and reduce the response size by specifying only the fields that are required. Take the scenario where you need a specific product detail for all the products in stock. Using GraphQL, a single query can return everything that you need at once. With REST, you'd need to perform one query to get the request, and then one additional query for each item in that return list. Mutation is the term GraphQL uses to describe updating, deleting of data. And permissions can be applied to each of these actions to limit only to authorized users. Subscriptions are used to receive updates to data as changes happen without the need for polling. This makes interactive features like showing the latest number of orders or having information appear on the screen as it happens or building chat applications easier to build. Startups do all this with AppSync and they build scalable applications on top of it, even those requiring real-time updates or across a range of different data sources. Web APIs are the front door to your internal application and your customer's private data yet they operate in public and over the internet. To secure the end-to-end -end connection, encrypt data when it's being transported. And this is what the commonly used phrase encryption in flight means. That is, if anyone could intercept the data, they would not be able to read the data as it was already been encrypted. Only the private key holder, in this case, the web server can read it. Encrypted endpoints start with HTTPS and the S showing that it's in a secure connection. TLS is the industry standard used for encrypted connections. It's replacing the still commonly used SSL certificates. Where possible though, use the more secure TLS connections. 
Amazon Certificate Manager can generate both SSL and TLS certificates for free, and these can then be imported into public access points such as AppSync or API Gateway. Regulated industries or the most security sensitive customers require the highest levels of security. With API Gateway, you can specify the minimum TLS uh, version to enforce the most secure connection possible. Authentication and authorization controls who has access and what they can do. Authentication means confirming your identity and websites do this by requiring a username and a password. For APIs, this is often a secret key. And using API keys, you can limit the access to your API or by using Amazon Cognito, you can use its access control and sign up features, allowing customers to create their own API keys. Whereas authorization refers to allowing or preventing access to a specific resource. And this could be like an administrator page. Startups building software as a service or SaaS products must guarantee that private data is only accessible by the correct customer. Multi-tenancy systems achieve this with a single system. And using access controls, this is the preferred approach as you only have one system to maintain. You can use Identity Access Management, and this is commonly known as IAM, to provide secure access to all resources. This could be data or different AWS services. The best practice is to minimize access to resources, only grant permissions where absolutely required. Your customers likely use your API as part of a sequence of interactions to achieve an important goal. After all, why else would they have spent the time to integrate it in the first place? An SLA, known as a service level agreement, can be used to describe how your service will perform and what number of requests or uptime percentage your customers' developers can expect. Using this will make you a reliable piece of that sequence. Developers will handle failures, though good API design makes this predictable. For example, not all errors are equal. Sometimes it's a user error or it could be an internal system or capacity problems. Each of these cause errors. And each of these errors requires a specific response. And informing the user via HTTP error code makes this clear. Errors with a 400 series are client problems. And this tells the developer to look at the request. As the 500 series errors tell you that there's a server side problem. And you should probably go look at the logs. For example, a 429 error is when there are too many requests. And this will tell the developer to wait a little bit or back off and then try again later. It doesn't matter if it's a different color, a move button, or a complete redesign. We can figure out as humans the change and then adapt our behavior to it. Machines simply cannot do this. So you need to be aware of the downstream impact when changing, adding, or removing functionality or data from your API. Developers will need to go into the code and make changes. And even with plenty of advance warning, there's no guarantee that this will happen. So you should version your API and support old versions for as long as possible. Versioning is supported by AppSync and API Gateway, though they have a different approach to how they implement it. When you think of scaling an API, remember its usage pattern is different to that of a website or mobile application. With even the most dedicated user, there are limits on how fast they can type or click, and they have predictable sleeping patterns. So often you can think of the scaling of a web or mobile application based on the number of users, and then follow in some standard usage pattern that will play out over a day, a week, a month, or even a year. Well, machines, they never sleep and they are fast. So APIs scale differently and often independently from the number of users. One customer could send thousands of requests per second and machines can send more requests than humans can in short, unpredictable bursts. These could be caused by scripts, batch jobs, or even bugs in customer code. Having an automatically scalable API and supporting infrastructure is vital to be able to maintain and stick to your SLA and keep your API working under load any time of day and night. Scaling is easier than it ever has been before thanks to auto-scaling, load balancers, and serverless compute. API Gateway and AppSync just work, whether it's from a few requests 
to millions of requests, and it's without you having to make any changes. API Gateway and AppSync both offer security, scalability, and a pay-as-you-use. So you can pick the one that is best suited to your technology needs and for your use case. There are no hard and fast rules, and I try to think of it from the point of view of who will use your API. And that could be your developers or your customers' developers, and then think about what are their needs. Mobile and web developers will benefit from using GraphQL on AppSync. When screens need to be updated or user journeys change, developers can change the response without having to dive into backend code. They can just alter the query. And subscriptions give a real-time experience and AppSync's ability to work offline and then sync your data later makes your applications work even without a mobile connection or a spotty connection. Backend developers are familiar with REST. And using API Gateway provides an interface that works with a wide range of developer tools and makes it easy and fast to predictable to build against. If you have known access patterns, these are an excellent fit too, because you know how your customers will use your API and then you can optimize for that use case. And HTTP natively supports caching and REST APIs will get that built in. There is really no wrong choice. Plus, AppSync and API Gateway will make it easier to build, maintain, and scale your interface. So pick based on your customers' likely needs, and then get started. The next step is to build your first API by exploring API Gateway Developer Portal and AppSync SDK. Remember to sign up for Activate for free training, technical support, and credits, and get a head start. And it's used by some of the most successful startups including Stripe, Klarna, and Slack. $1,000 is available to bootstrap startups, and it grows with you. And credits are increased up to $100,000 through our venture capital partners. To hear directly from the engineering teams at startups, subscribe to Startup Engineering, a podcast where founders, CTOs, and engineers walk through how they overcame their technical challenges and built their products.